Welcome to the Afikra podcast. My name is Mikey Mhenna. Today we have another episode in our special series in partnership with the Art Center at NYU Abu Dhabi. With me is Dorian Paul Rogers, Salem Al Attas, and uh, Maryam Al Shehi, um, all of whom are involved with Rooftop Rhythms. I'm really excited to welcome all of you here. We're going to learn a little about each of you first, but Dorian, let me start with you. Um, for somebody who's never, ever heard of what you're doing, what is the easiest way to describe Rooftop Rhythms, uh, a organization that you founded? Uh, Rooftop Rhythms Poetry Open Mic, I would say it's just a collective of storytellers and people seeking positive self-expression. And I think if that piques your interest in any way, uh, I think people would love to be a part of a community like that. What does it sort of, for somebody who's listening to this podcast who, um, you know, before they search what this is, when you talk about storytelling, you, you talk about poetry, um, what do you want them to conjure in their sort of mind's eye in terms of what this thing actually looks like, what these events sort of look like? Uh, to me, in a broad sense, poetry is the crafting of words and I usually say poetry performances, but you see, I just use it interchangeably when I started uh, to answer your question to say storytellers, because I think poets also still tell stories. Um, there's no, with both the form and free verse movements that have happened over the past 100 years, there's so many ways to kind of find your voice through different ways of crafting. So for me, I consider poetry the crafting of words. And the beautiful thing is when you have a sustained community, we notice that the audience members come to kind of hear how people take the stage to craft their words, to share their perspective, their truth. And I really like that the audience almost seems to support the first timers, maybe doing some simple in rhyme poem, maybe more than the veteran Salamatas, because they're like, we know he's good. He found his voice. So I just picture that as a, a way to describe the show, uh, the crafting of words and people sharing their perspectives and stories. Yeah, that's right. Um, Medium, you're a student at NYU right now. Do you remember the first show you attended? I was actually uh, thinking about this this morning, like the first show I attended and the first show I performed. The yeah. first show I attended, I think it was during um, this weekend or week at NYU. Like my first week, it was called Marhaba. Dorian, it was the, that was my first show, right? So it was during my marhaba, and I was really fascinated by this uh, community and just seeing everyone organically and naturally come together. Uh, performers on stage, and then if anyone from the audience wants to perform, it was like an open mic event. So I think, yeah, that was my first uh, show in 2019. Nice. Salem, what about you? Uh, right before we started, uh, right before we started um, filming, I was, you know, asking about your bio and, and Dorian jumped in and said, oh, Saddam is one of our day ones. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, April of 2013, so about 10 years ago, was the first time I ever performed. Um, but even before, but before that, the month before, there was the International Book Fair in Abu Dhabi at uh, Adnet. And I saw that they had a spoken word uh, open mic section. And so I went and I found them and I met Dorian there and I competed and I, you know, I was, I did, I did horribly. I got last place, but that's where I got introduced to rooftop rhythms and I asked him, you know, how often do you guys do this? And then the very next month I got to form a rooftop for the first time. So, so nice. Okay. So for people who can see the screen, we're going to play a, a trailer that's up on the uh, NYU Abu Dhabi Arts uh, Center channel. And this will, this is a short little trailer that gives you a sense, at least some of the, pictures and videos uh, of the scene. So let's take a look. Okay, so that was for, that was a trailer, sort of an ad Dorian for, I believe the last one. Um, how often do these take place? What is the format? What can somebody expect if they show up to something like this? Yeah, so we typically go 
once a month from September to usually May or June. Um, and the shows alternate from what I like to specifically call a poetry open mic. We are open to other talents, but I've always been a purist. Uh, there are other open mic formats, as you know, anywhere around the world, typically music open mics, but we always wanted to kind of pay homage, homage to our what we started out doing and what we intended the show to be. Um, so uh, we do open mic and then on alternate months, we do open mic and a poetry slam competition, which is a really popular uh, form of spoken word, which is a little more intense since there's competition and we get five random judges from the crowd and they don't need to know anything about poetry. That's the kind of fun part, it's all subjective. Uh, and then we alternate these shows in recent seasons, I would say after the pandemic, we've started to take the show on the road. So the art center, strategic partners in the community, as well as some of my relationships will find a venue. For example, Manorada Al Sadiat on Sadiat Island. Uh, we did a show in November at Louvre, I'm sorry, in December at Louvre Abu Dhabi. Um, so that's pretty much the format as you can see in a picture here. Uh, it's a really nice nightlife event. And we also like to say it's a family friendly event for all ages. And it's just like a nice community outing for a multicultural audience. That's so, what I yeah, yeah, I wanna talk about that, the word, the, the term poetry slam. So basically like a poet, like if I'm gonna go, uh, if I see an ad on the wall that says uh, spoken word, right? Like an evening of spoken word, that means something different than like attend a poetry slam, right? Right. Sometimes people use them interchangeably if they yeah. don't know all the nuances of poetry. Uh, poetry, a reading, for example, I would picture in a, in a very academic sense. So I would, this is not a bad thing or anything, but like I'll picture Miriam as more, I don't know if you agree, Miriam, as kind of a uh, person who would run a poetry reading where she may pull out a notebook, she may pull out a book, and the uh, the emphasis is more so on the crafting of her words, also the eloquence with which she speaks, her tone, her voice inflection. Um, and you may see something like a published professor give a reading, right? Now you may see Solemn, uh, who is more of a spoken word artist, who's also a great writer. But when he reads, he's uh, he can speak up uh, if you'd like to add to this, but he's going to use more volume control, speed variance, uh, he's focusing on like the techniques of public speaking, how to galvanize the audience, how to get them snapping their fingers. It's much more like a tribal feel, which Solomon make speak on this as well as Nabati poetry. It's history and the storytelling and being more of a communal activity with call and response uh, cues and things of that. And then slam from an academic standpoint by meaning is that it is a competition uh, you may not make it to the first round. Now we're scoring poets. And that may not be for the faint of heart when it comes to poets. And sometimes you have a Pulitzer Prize winning poet who will never do spoken word, only poetry readings. You will have uh, spoken word artists who will never slam because they don't want a score. And then you got some people try to do it all. And uh, to me, that's the mastery when you can master the page and craft your words, but then also perform well, those are the, that's kind of like the jack of all trades to me. Yeah. Sanam, I saw you, I saw you shaking your head when he started, <laughs> he, he started to um, uh, conjure images of uh, being scored and being judged. Um, yeah. Well, is it, are these painful memories? Sanam, you don't really even, well, he used to do slam a lot. Yeah, He still slams. Yeah. Well, I'll say this. I have lost more slams than I've won. Number one. Number two. The very first slam that I competed in, um, there was somebody who had a time penalty. And so they were deducted off of their total score. And I still got last place. So mm. it was a brutal experience for me. But, um, you know, I fell in love with it. I'm a naturally competitive person. And I think competition helped me focus not just on the impact of the words or the words I'm saying, but also the performance aspect that helped me be, you know, find my voice, fi find that edge. And yeah. also I could see that, you know, my poetry isn't for everybody and that's okay. So for example, I know that if most of the judges are teachers, I'm not going to win. 
that I'm, I'm not their crowd, you know, but if it's people who are more, you know, from my generation, people who are hungry, people who are looking for somebody to articulate what they feel, but they don't know how to say, then I would do better. So it's, yeah. you know, it, it's for everybody. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, like this idea of, um, it's counterintuitive, right? Because you would think that the element of competition would create animosity uh, and not foster community, but obviously like the domain of, of athletics is, you know, serves a really, really good counterpoint where <clears throat> the element of actually comp competition, you know, coagulates people and like brings people together um, and actually kind of makes it a lot less, <laughs> you know, like standoffish. I, I think <laughs> it's fun uh, to compete with each other. I think it all depends on if the medium that you're competing in is adversarial in nature. So for example, rock climbers are very helpful to each other in competition and saying, yeah. you should take that route. You should go, you should climb this direction. And I think poetry is, is the same way. It's collaborative and it's, um, it's something that wants to foster, uh, you know, relationships in its nature versus being adversarial. So bringing spoken word just kind of adds something that isn't, I, I'd say natural to a uh, regular po you know, poetry community. Yeah. Okay, Mariam, I want to ask you a question. Um, when people think about regular poetry communities or even like literary communities in general, like uh, some of the impressions are that it's not very welcoming, that people are very stuck up and it's sort of standoffish. How did you go from the first Marhaba show where you attended to um, being sort of enveloped into uh, a broader community? Like what are sort of the broader pillars of that community that would get somebody like you to actually want to, to take part? Yeah, so I started with the Art Center in my first year. I was performing in a play about womanhood with an Emirati uh, scriptwriter, an Emirati, direct, Emirati writer, and uh, Emirati cast members. Um, and I was regularly attending a rooftop every single month, even when we moved. Uh, so this was like the year of the pandemic. So we moved online immediately. And I was also attending these shows online. And um, like from the pandemic until the year where we returned in person, I was seeing how this community was growing and how this community was like, we're all taking care of each other in some way. We're all cheering for each other. We're all supporting each other. Uh, when I finished performing a poem or whatever, um, some people would come to me and they'd say, wow, this resonated. Uh, we really like the way you did this or that. And we'd discuss about what we saw. So um, I think that just this community that is very fostering and very nurturing in its essence is what made me want to be part of it. And it's what made me want to be part of Rooftop's uh, stage. Um, as I mentioned, like immediately after the pandemic, when we launched the first in-person show in the Louvre, um, I was really excited to just be very vulnerable on stage and share my poetry and my craft with everyone. Amazing. Um, so I'm just going to put both you and Salem on the spot. I'm going to warn you from now. I'd love to talk a little bit about some of the pieces that come to mind. Not right now, but I want you to have this sort of cooking in the background. Um, Dorian, I'm curious about you. Uh, people who are listening to your voice could probably guess that you did not grow up in Abu Dhabi. Um, so I want to think back to that, uh, you know, 11 years ago when you started trying to work on this. Um, did you feel like it would still be here 11 years later and that this community would actually grow into something that's organic? Um, or were you like, eh, there's a shot in the dark. I just miss going to these events. I didn't put much thought into it in the very beginning. For me, it was um, this is just a part of my DNA. So as an 18 year old or going to Florida State University, uh, there was just a similar open mic to what I've tried to foster called Back Talk Poetry Troop uh, by a group called Black on Black Rhyme. Um, which is a play on words with black on black crime, you know, breaking against stereotypes and statistics. Um, and so I didn't really even want to go to a poetry night. I was more into hip hop, Jay-Z, flashy, I, you know, just trying to sound cool and stuff. Um, but I was always brought in a, up in a spiritual household. So I also yearned for positivity and like, what if there was a way to be a part of something that was cool and hip, but also positive and moving in the right path? you know, in life. 
And so one day a friend dragged me to this open mic and it just, it blew me away. So when I decided to move here, I had already had years of experience of kind of planning my own open mics after university, uh, planning, uh, co-organizing poetry slam competitions with like 30 teams. So I had like a culture and arts background, uh, but I was blessed to come to Abu Dhabi through teaching. So when I moved here, there were just so many Westerners uh, initially, um, and I'm talking about in the thousands, mainly Americans, uh, a lot more than uh, a lot more then than now. Some of them have gone back there after a few years. But basically, when I looked around, there may have been like a monthly party for to, that catered to kind of the, the Westerners at the time. Uh, things are much different now. But at the time, there just wasn't much that was catering kind of specifically to Americans and American teacher community. Like I said, that was in the thousands. So for me, I, it was just kind of a no brainer. I was like, uh, they have to like this. I mean, it's the same people that are attending these same events in America. So it wasn't that I like kind of created anything new. An open mic format with a DJ is kind of just a standard thing in any town in America. Atlanta, Georgia, where I live, for example, may have had six to eight of them. And so when we organize an event there, we'd be happy with 50 people. You know, that's like a great night. So uh, when I decided uh, with some friends at the time to go ahead and try it in March 2012, we did it at Cafe Arabia in Abu Dhabi, and like more than 100 people came, like with no pay promotion. And just from then on, it just was like, this is something. And I, since I already had a background in knowing exciting audiences, excited audiences and people who are really into arts and culture, you know, when you're playing a good event, uh, they basically were asking for it. And, uh, you know, I knew at that point that I wanted to kind of do it on a monthly basis. And I guess naturally over a period of time, I just realized that if we just keep a healthy community going, a uh, positive community, it will feed itself. Uh, Miriam is emceeing this event on March 31st, our 11th anniversary show. Salamatas wow. has uh, emceed our events. So I try to kind of de-emphasize it being the Dorian show. And now it's more about like, if I leave or if something, God forbid, happens to me, uh, this is a movement hopefully that can just continue on because people always are going to want to share their voice and their craft. And poetry is a, a, a respected art form way before I came along, way before modern poetry. It was just beautiful to move here and turn on a television. And it was like Arabic poetry channel number one, Arabic poetry channel. We don't have any poetry channels in America. So it's just an honor to kind of have found the right country and to move here kind of at the right space and time to be able to kind of launch that with the support of the community. Yeah, no, I love it. Um, and that context is super interesting. I mean, um, Asanam, earlier on we were talking and uh, Dorian mentioned Nabati poetry and Hala, he's just talking about the, the you know, the, <laughs> the plethora of poetry that is found in popular media here. Um, before you came across these open mics, did you fashion yourself a poet? Did you think of yourself, yeah, this is something I love, there's a medium I love, or did you come at it through from hip hop and sort of from this, the same angle that Dorian came at it? No, no, I, I was writing poetry since the fifth grade, um, sporadically, randomly, but I, I always wrote poetry. Um, you know, when you're younger and you're, everything is jumbled up in here, it's so much easier to deal with it when it's written down in front of you. So it was mm -hmm. almost like a, like a problem solving tool, but I never thought of it going anywhere. I never really thought about performing. It was just something I did. I don't even think I would have called myself a poet. I, I think poetry was just something I wrote any more than somebody that doodles in class would call himself an artist, you know? And so I'm just grateful that I fell into it. I mean, if you, my high school friends, when they found that I started doing poetry, were so confused because it never came up in conversation. It wasn't something that I mm. talked about. It wasn't a big part of who I was. But given the opportunity, it's now, you know, such a huge part of my identity. Yeah. Do you remember the first poem you were proud of? <laughs> yes, I do. Because uh, I let my sister hear this poem I, I, I wrote a poem and my sister was like, Saddam, is love all you write about? Is that all you know how to write about? And I was just, I was so angry. I'm like, I need some feedback. Can I, can I get some support? But she was right. And so I wrote this poem about myself. And it was a very honest poem. And I tried to make it funny. And I tried to, you know, be as real as possible. And I remember 
a poet that I really respected, her name was Sara Sufi. After she heard the poem, she said, this felt like I was really listening to you. And that was the poem I realized I had finally found my voice. Mm. So you, you were doing, a, you were a, doing an impression of like a love poetry until you finally oh, broke yeah, out. Oh yeah, I was doing any, any poem I heard of on Def Jam poetry. I was doing Shaheen, I was doing Black Eyes. I was doing any of these guys. And then finally, when I just decided to talk about myself, it made it a lot easier to just sound like me. Yeah. Yeah. Tough, tough criticism is usually the, one, <laughs> the ones that break, yeah. break through. Mediam, what so about you? I'm curious. I'm curious about um, your relationships. Did you also sort of grow up on a steady, st- steady diet of sort of like classical, um, you know, spoken word that you would hear on Def Jam as well? Or did you come at it from more traditional Arabic poetry too? Yeah, my experience was very similar to Sodom's. I grew up uh, re- being in love with classical Arabic poetry. Yeah. And I grew up with this notion that anything that's not classical is not like real or original poetry, if you know what I mean. So I was writing poetry from a very young age, uh, but I didn't define it or classify it as poetry because to me, poetry was al Mutanabi and Abu Faras al-Hamadani and all of these legends in, in Arabic. Um, but then I remember the first poem I wrote, the first real poem I wrote was also about love and heartbreak. And I just felt an urge. I remember I felt um, an urge to write. And um, this urge led me to just simply um, like write my feelings in words. That's how I remember the experience. Just I just wanted to put my feelings and everything I'm feeling in simple words. Um, and but I was never performing and I was never like taking what I did very seriously until um, NYU, honestly, and until I saw this community of people who just want to who just have this urge of writing and have this urge of sharing on stages. Um, I remember the first poem I shared uh, with Rooftop. It was uh, at the Louvre, as I mentioned, and it was the wellness edition. So this was like after the pandemic and after things started getting back to in person. Uh, it was called Skin on Skin. And uh, it was basically just sharing about my um, mental um, and physical struggles during the pandemic. Can I ask a question about um, the nature of a poem like that? So Skin on Skin, right? Um, you know, like uh, if you're if you're presenting a, a, a painting, right? Um, and you frame it, that's kind of, or you sort of hang it on the wall. That's kind of when the, the project ends, right? You record a song. I mean, you, you continue to perform it, but it's sort of the, the composition process sort of ends there. Um, how do you end the process of writing a, a poem like that? I mean, is it, does it end the first time you perform it? Does it, does it continue to evolve in your head on stage uh, on the page. Let's start with you, Maryam. I'm curious about this process for you. Yeah, I think it depends on the poem, but I feel like after the performance ends, usually I have like conversations with the audience. And through these conversations, I think a lot about the poem and I think about my craft. Um, so it really depends on on the poem. But usually I reflect and revisit my poetry. Yeah. Salem, what about you? Because I, I'm curious, I could imagine that... Um, it sort of changes over time. Oh yeah, I I treat it the same way like a stand-up comic is preparing for a special. So usually what I would do is I used to go to these smaller open mics when I would have a draft of a poem or a poem that I you know I, I, I like and I'd perform it and I'd see how the crowd responds, what they like, what they don't like, and I would adjust accordingly. And once I found that the poem is exactly where I want it to be, that's when I would perform it on a bigger stage like rooftop or something like that. Um, But yeah, I agree. The the writing process doesn't end at the performance. It ends when it says what I want it to say. And that what I want to say might change over time. It's interesting because like you alluded to this idea of, uh, you you alluded to the natural comparison to stand-up, right? Uh, But stand-ups by and large are, exclusively trying to make the audience laugh. I mean, they're also trying to make them think uh, at times, but the the actual goal, any self-respecting stand-up, the actual goal 
is trying to get laughter no matter what, right? Yeah. Um, involuntary I, yeah. laughter. What are you trying I to think, get? I think for me, it's uh, more than anything I'm trying to entertain. More than I'm mm. trying to express some vulnerable emotions. More than I am trying to get some message or some motivation. I want to make people laugh. Uh, or entertain them or get them excited or hype them up. I mean, there's a reason why almost every show Dorian has me start off the show so that I can hopefully inject some kind of positive energy that gives the other poets a, a hopefully more uh, captivated crowd to just get into. I'm the warm up act for these amazing poets. Yeah. Dorian, for you, um, you're thinking of it, I imagine, not from a um, a poet to poet perspective, right? You're thinking of it from an event to event perspective and from a year to year perspective and f- like in terms of movement building, um, for you, you know, what is the goal of all this? Well, as a, I came in as a poet, so, um, I definitely like to answer Solemn's, uh, yeah, go ahead. What's <laughs> let's answer all these <laughs> questions. You know, I would argue that Miriam would probably have a totally different answer, right? Um, we come with a myriad of personalities and humanity to the stage, right? And so Solomon's personality might just be that he's a giver, right? And he's a, he wants, um, you know, if, if his community is happy, then he could be happy. So maybe maybe he didn't want to open the show. Maybe he had a poem about, a reflective poem about, you know, he also speaks about self-esteem and uh, virtuous issues with helping young people. So maybe he had a heartfelt, vulnerable poem. I do still feel that if I say it's Solomon. Uh, we got a lot of new new poets today. I really need you to bring the energy. So, you know, his heart is an entertainer at heart. Um, and that's his choice if he says that he comes to entertain. But I will argue that he also comes to connect with other truth seekers, to impart knowledge on people. And he does that while he's also making you laugh. So I think he likes inserting humor into his work. Um, for me... I felt like I was misunderstood a lot as a child and um, kind of overlooked. So I think for when I'm writing poetry or even performing, I think being received is a big element for me. Like I want to be felt in a figurative way. Now, making you feel me could be like, ooh, did you hear what he just said? So that's kind of entertaining. But I also, uh, sometimes a crowd may never show any physical uh, ad- adulation for your performance, but they could be torn up inside because you kind of touched uh, a, a heartstring with something that they have also experienced. Sometimes you may hear a, a poet like Miriam share something about mental health and wellness, and a person may come up and say, I c- I've considered suicide. That poem saved my life tonight, you know? So I think you interview 100 poets, they may give variants of uh, a variety of answers and all are beautiful because it's just like we're all a part of the fabric of the world Um, from an organization standpoint because I don't always perform since the open mics are usually full um, I work with the art center and their producers and Bill Bregan the executive artistic director to often just try to curate a safe and positive environment where we're promoting artistry um, the art center is the one that kind of pushed for us to only have an original content on the open mic. And sometimes um, musicians may not like that idea because they're, they kind of start out doing cover. But since we feel like those platforms are available, we want artists to kind of use it, uh, poets and uh, musicians alike to use it to kind of craft their, you know, like as a, uh, Although Solomon said they, he sometimes went to other shows to be ready for this show. We also kind of intend for people to use it as a, a space to kind of form their voice um, through originality. And so that's like a big element. So uh, we think um, we think in those perspectives also kind of what would be a good theme if we're doing a special show. Um, for example, this is the first ever show on March 31st that has been done during Ramadan. Traditionally, we would kind of stop to kind of be quiet and pause and reflect. Um, but we noticed that the city uh, and the country is kind of evolving, where if there's kind of culturally appropriate things to happen during Ramadan, it could add to the fabric of the arts and culture scene. So this is like a new experiment for us. And so, for example, this is the reflection edition. So oftentimes on the back end, we're just trying to think of how to not make it like open mic slam, 
open mic slam, you know, what can we do to um, continue to provide a professional environment, a safe environment, but also one that's kind of pushing the envelope and keeping it, uh, uh, keeping it a good mix of entertainment and education. What have some of the other themes been? I, I heard a few of them, like wellness was one of them, Na- reflection, uh, you know, marhaba. What are some of the other themes that stick out? Um, Maryam, I see your, your face nodding. Do you have any that come to mind? Which one did we just do at Louvre again uh, in December? Uh, the, one, the Louvre was the wellness, right? Well, yeah. that was in 2020. Oh, yeah. 2020. Salah, which, one 2021. Did, Salah, which one did we do when you just, when you, you performed at that show? Do you remember what the topic was supposed to be about off the top of your head? Which, which one? The last one? The one in December, yeah. Of 2021. <laughs> Salah, let's forget it. We haven't done that many theme shows. So basically, okay. we, tradition is kind of a theme show when we're visiting another okay, gotcha. venue. So uh, we're both forgetting what was the theme of... No, no, no worries. That's okay. December. But uh, yeah, so I would say um, the show also naturally replenishes itself, I would say. Um, sometimes people who are only interested in kind of the buzz and are people making a lot of noise on a given night? Sometimes people will come to me and say, yeah, they're all new poets, you know? But that's the kind of the fun thing about an open mic is like, there's no control over the talent level. But the fun thing is like, we're continuing to foster a positive crowd where uh, we may have 90% new people who may not have said anything that may wow you from a craftsmanship or craftswomanship standpoint, but you'll now see audience members, Solomon and Miriam, I don't know if you hear this too, but they'll be like, it is just so amazing that people are sharing, like we, we're a part of a community where people can comfortably share whatever, you know, their story. And so yeah. I think if you come with that mindset, uh, it's not as much the focal point of what is the topic of tonight as more so just seeing people go on their journey. Uh, Salah may be at the peak of his journey as a poet. Miriam could be at the beginning of hers. And we kind of cherish those journeys all together. So, Dorian, as somebody who's hosted similar events all over the, you know, in the U.S. and here now. If I just closed my eyes and I was just listening to the audio track of one of your events. Would it be obvious that this is an event happening in Abu Dhabi? Because of the the subject matter or because of the, the influences, are there, is there something that feels uniquely rooted in this geography? I would like, uh, Solomon, I think you've been there as long as me. What do you think? I, I, I don't always think from, uh, are there elements that are maybe UAE or just regional, really, regional focus. Exactly, and, and I may not know enough about the cultural. region. I think Solomon may know more. Are there regional elements or cultural elements, Solomon, you think, to that make it unique to the UAE? I'll say Abu Dhabi feels different than Dubai. I will say that an uh, open mic in Sharjah feels different than a one in Abu Dhabi, that's different than one in Oman, different in Kuwait. So I've been to, to poetry events in all those places. And I've also been to shows in D.C. I've been to shows in Houston. And they all have a different feel. One of the things that I feel um, is special about like the UAE and this region is that diversity of thought. There are people who are coming from so many different kinds of backgrounds. I mean, just take me and Maryam, for example. We come from very similar backgrounds and we have very similar upbringings and even similar relationships with poetry. But the way that we approach them is very uniquely Maryam and it's very uniquely Salem. And I think just having that kind of uh, diverse thought is something very special to the region here. Salem, put some meat on the bone, all right? Like imagine you're speaking to, to some, somebody who's gone to tons of open mics in, okay. in Los Angeles or London, right? They're like, what are you okay. talking about? Everyone has a unique thing. Like what, what is kind of unique? What, okay, I'll, what I'll is different like or characteristic? Yeah. I'll put it like this. Every city or every country, they have a kind of mold or they, they have a kind of templates of successful poems. If you perform these kinds of poems, you're going to be successful. So if you want Washington, D.C., it's going to be about institutional racism. If you're in Houston, it's going to be about identity and breaking away from the mold that your family wants you to be an expectation. If you're in Abu Dhabi, 
It could be either of those things. It could be about diaspora. It could be mental health. It could be struggling with school. It could be struggling with losing hair. It could be all everything and anything because everybody here has this kind of feeling when they're performing, like if they don't say what they're going to say, they're going to explode. So when you come from a society where people are used to externalizing all their experiences, poetry isn't special in that regard. But when you come from a people who respect the privacy of their, 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 their community, the privacy in their home, and even their own privacy, when they come on the stage, this is letting something out that they haven't before. And so in that way, it really feels like each poet is an individual. Cool. That's great. I like, Amy, to, add, I like to add to that, that uh, I think sometimes when you get into certain scenes, right? So like he's mentioning, you might go to the Bay Area scene, which is Oakland. L.A. may have a scene. But with that comes the perceived success of a poet, a poet is trying to figure out what can they do possibly to make this a full time gig. This could be people's livelihoods trying to come to a poetry open mic. It's life or death. Can they perform a poem tonight? Can you get them on the mic? And they may or may not be trying to win a slam so that they can help pay their rent. It's just each city has is going to have different dynamics. So like Solemn said, maybe it is poets are more apt to fit a mold in D.C., I'm not saying there aren't original poets in all these cities or in New York. You're going, you may bring the style that's similar to New York. And I think one reason that Abu Dhabi doesn't really have that identity at the show is because there are just so many nationalities. Uh, there are people who are just finding out about poetry at the first time. There's not really a it's hard to say that Abu Dhabi has this as its street culture. You know, what does that mean? You know, these things are it's such a young country. All these things are being defined and redefined daily. So I think um, you can't really say that's an Abu Dhabi poet. You never heard anybody say that, Salam or Meriam. Um, we're just such a multicultural, like melting pot. And then since it's also a family oriented show, it's just like you, you don't know what you're going to get, but it feels like you're going to get more of a humanity, you know, a message about either your personal life, your wellness, humanity humanity kind of in the absence of political discourse because uh, in the uae that's not how the culture operates to kind of actively criticize entities whether that's outside or inside of the country um so since that's not the one of the things that uh, can be spoken about it kind of focuses the artist to kind of look back inside and look at all the many other topics that we can discuss um so we still feel very free as artists to be able to kind of share these images but uh, and messages, but they don't feel pretentious like you may hear of this scene because it doesn't feel like artists, although they do have professional aspirations in poetry, it doesn't feel like they're trying to kind of fit in. It seems like they're free to be themselves. So uh, I do kind of think that is what's cool. unique about Abu Dhabi in this culture. Amazing. Mariam, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, like, this multicultural identity is what makes this rooftop in Abu Dhabi. And even, like, seeing rooftop, let's say, at NYU Abu Dhabi or in different places, it's also has its different identity. Because at NYU Abu Dhabi, for example, you'll see students talking about um, homesickness or trying um, struggling with belonging to the city or falling in love with uh, whatever, you know? So... It also differs whether you're on campus at NYU Abu Dhabi or you're in the city or you're at events at APID or, yeah. Yeah, it, it's super interesting. I mean, um, okay, I have to change the subject for a second. And uh, this is for the panel, but Dorian, I'm going to start with you. Has it ever been on a rooftop? <laughs> <laughs> all no, these no, pictures no. are all yeah. these pictures are practically in basements how is it called rooftop rhythms right that's a good one so basically <laughs> we always have to uh, shout out uh, uh other people that was doing poetry uh one lady's name is bahare um who was doing kind of big uh one-off events of kind of spoken word poetry readings and then in la there was a group called a group of teachers who only wanted in LA and who only wanted to do a private show for teachers on their roof. Um, and so basically it was called poetry slamming on the roof. 
And with an events planning background, I contacted them after attending the show a few times and saying, you know, this I'm inspired by you all. This title kind of con concept hit me called Rooftop Rhythms. And so actually a fir the first, I would say, five to seven events were like stuck to literal rooftops. And um, I think since then, we've kind of used it as a figurative meaning. So now we say kind of speak your truth from the roof. So mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of like the roof as a symbol of projection or speaking out. Uh, and so this is kind of how we've continued on with the name. And so the funny thing is no one really asked me that question. <laughs> no one ever. I almost up. with Mediam and Saddam <laughs> as my witness, I almost got a spit, spit take, like an authentic spit take. <laughs> I almost did. Yeah, you, you asked it while I was uh, drinking the water. But uh, no one actually asked, like, what are where's where's this is false <laughs> advertisement. Where's the roof, man? <laughs> where's the roof? Um, but yeah, so that's the funny story. That's funny. Um, okay, so Asad, I'm going to start with you, and then I'm going to go to Mediam. Um, uh, in terms of uh, memorable moments over the last 11 years, uh, poems that either you uh, you performed or poems that you uh, heard, are there any that come to mind that sort of still stick with you? There are earworms, or that every now and then you keep on going back to them thinking, ah, oh, I can't get that out of my head. And Dorian, I'm going to go out to go to you third. So when it comes to uh, memorable moments, uh, I think the, the answer people would expect was to, is to say when I won the my first Grand Slam or when I won other slam competitions. But actually, my most memorable moment is when I won Performer of the Year. Because that, you know, I always felt insecure about my writing. I, I felt insecure about my poetry but I never felt insecure about my performance. And so when I got that, it just felt, it was just so validating because that's where I felt like I put the most effort into. And that, that's the word that means the most to me. I got that in 2014. I still have that award. I still have that medal. Um, when it comes to poems that meant something to me, Jason Zane wrote a poem called uh, Dear Miss Anonymous. And anyone and everyone who's heard it that it's one of their top five favorite poems at Rooftop Rhythms. It's just a devastatingly beautiful piece. And yeah, that's got to be my favorite that I've heard. Nice. Mariam, what about you? I think when it comes to memorable moments, uh, the moment at the Louvre was truly memorable to me that I keep on talking about it until today. Uh, the Wellness Edition in 2021, especially because it was... The first show after transitioning from an online setting to an in-person setting. And especially because it was my first time performing about a very vulnerable topic and being vulnerable on stage about mental wellness. Um, and I still remember the conversations after I performed. And I still remember the heat in my face and how everyone was like, wow, you're so brave and all of that. But I just remember it, just feeling the heat in my body. But it was very satisfying just to stand on stage and talk about a very sensitive topic in front of everyone for the first time. Um, and then there's this topic, uh, there's this poem by um, another poet um, from Rooftop, Hamad Anis, called Frankenstein, that I hear it all the time, but it's, I, it's always like the first time I hear it. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's all about anxiety, right? Is that? or about like um, being an outsider or something like that. But every time I hear it, it's the way he performs it. And just like the words of the poem, they always resonate. And it's always like the first time I hear it. Hmm. So Dorian, before you answer this question, thanks, Medium. Before you answer this question, um, so it, is it typical, uh, just going off what Medium said, is it typical for poets, poets to re-perform the same piece over the course of a few different shows? Is that a normal practice? I would say so. You you kind of see with the beginning or emerging poets, there be some ego thing at a certain point where you may ask them, are you performing? You did an amazing job. Last time they say, well, the poem I want to do, I did that three months ago. And so I had to learn that too. It's kind of a pride thing. I always wanted to bring a new poem every time. Um, but I had to learn that over a period of time. But I'll also just tell poets like, there's probably only one person that was in that audience three months ago, but there's somebody that needs to hear that poem tonight. Uh, 
So um, people do do that. I, I don't I would repeat a poem two months in a row if it was on my heart, you know, um, because it's it's just a low chance that the same crowd will be there. But then the surprising thing about human nature is Solomon could do that poem. And if I heard that before, I would be in the audience probably like, oh, he did that last. Time. Oh, man, you're going to love this, you know, because uh, poetry kind of often comes at you fast. And so it's just like hearing a song you like a second time. Nobody's like, I heard that on the radio last week. Yeah. You know, it's a new song. It's just understood that that's that person's poem. So I think poets, sometimes we're in <clears throat> in our own heads too much when we overthink that. Before I let you answer the question, I just have another sort of logistical question, right? So how does the open mic work? So do is it like a sign-up sheet in the back or are you have you curated this list way before the, the date and then people come in and they come in and say they're one poem or do they have five minutes or how does it work exactly? Yeah, so basically we give them like three to five minutes in the, on a slam show when there's also the competition. Time is limited, so people are kind of limited. To three o'clock, we're not going to start playing the Oscars music but you know, we just ask artists to kind of adhere to those timings. And then if it's an open mic, we have kind of three to five minutes, no, no limitation on how many poems you do in that slot. Um, and then it is more of an open mic. It's still inherently an open mic, but it's more of a sign up process. Uh, there's nothing to qualify you uh, to perform. So it's still open mic by request, but there are important things that we have to curate from a logistical standpoint. Um, and one of them is a very important, like adherence to UAE appropriateness expectations. And I'm just so thankful that the country has supported this show for all of these years. But, you know, um, there's a there's a lot of trust there. You know, when you're going to bring 20 something people, you bring 20 something the people to speak at a wedding, you're going to have a problem. Right. <laughs> Somebody's going to say the wrong thing. So, you know, we do feel the need to have that kind of both the buffer in place in advance of the show for people to kind of understand UAE law, to understand cultural dynamics here and also what we consider culturally appropriate uh, for a family show. So it is um, there is some kind of pre prep time. But I would say a traditional open mic is you kind of walk up to an open mic, you sign up um, and that works for some entities. Yeah. So what are, what are the moments, uh, going back to that question, what are some moments or a poem that hit, hit you a special way? If you see me at the show, Solomon and Mary might laugh, but I'm always emotional at the show, you know, because I, if it's a first timer, I'm like, man, Solomon, wait till five years from now. You know, like we've all gone on that journey. I remember Miriam's first time performing and how nervous she was. Now I just saw her. We just did a kind of improv poetry event where we had to write a poem in 40 minutes and perform it based on words from the crowd. We just did that at the Apple flagship store at Galleria Mall. She was the first poet out of the four to finish. And the other poets had done it like three to four times. She had never done this event before. So like, she's a very confident person, not saying because of rooftop rhythm specifically, but because of her drama theater background and growing as a young artist, you know, we get to see these people's journeys. Um, but also other things that stand out to me is like anytime people with special abilities are involved in the show, um, th that's a tearjerker just to see that poetry uh, is for all, you know. So we had a collaboration with the Special Olympics where they, uh, a couple of our poets, Anise being one of them, Mary Ashe, he uh, shouted him out. But um, he, he and another poet kind of met with two special abilities students or youth, uh, Emirati youth, and kind of helped them to workshop through a poem. And then they came on stage with their mentor and performed. I don't know. I believe, Solomon, you were there. Uh, at that yeah, show. I was there. And I also, I also got the opportunity to work with the Special Olympics to help uh, um, to, uh, to uh, work on her poetry that she ended up performing at the opening ceremony. And I just wanted to add, I remember, I remember coming up to Miriam on the day of the Louvre event. And I remember I'm like, I didn't realize it was your first performance. And I was like, this is amazing. You need to keep coming. You need don't stop doing this. Cause I always get excited when I see Emiratis who are performing at the event. And I was worried that I scared her because I was very much like, you need to keep doing this, you know? And, but, um, so I'm just so glad to see that she's like a big part of the community and the fact that like, you know, Dorian now has her on the roster of poets he can depend on when it comes to uh, representing Rooftop. So I'm just, I'm really happy. Thank you. Um, um, and 
And I would also say, adding to that, uh, Blank Canvas is a community arts group. They were also helpful with that event, I think helped mentor some of the uh, poets with special abilities. We also have another poet named Razamataz, a real cool guy um, who has special abilities. And so he does not speak uh, his poetry. So he'll oftentimes get a poet like myself to perform. And so we always shout him out and you could just see uh, how he elated he is just to have that community that supports him. Uh, and a couple other things I would say, whenever kind of poets I've looked up to over the years, think enough of our cultural scene here to fly here, um, sometimes paying their own flight, I give them a feature fee, but artists who just kind of want to expand their reach as poets um, have come over the years, one being Patricia Smith, who is a National Book Award finalist and one of the deadliest spoken word artists uh, you'll ever know. Uh, she won National Poetry Slam Individual, which is the world's biggest uh, kind of slam competition. She's a multi-time individual winner. Um, some other friends of mine, like G. Yamazawa, who's a now a very pop popular rapper and poet, uh, Matthew Cuban Hernandez, uh, just a, a, a poet that I kind of came up with before I moved here to see them move, I'm sorry, visit here. Keith Rogers, the guy who started Back Talk Poetry Troop, which was the group that got me into poetry. So to see these friends uh, come here and to see the impact that we kind of have all made together, uh, it's very impressive. And you know what? Not to brag, but like we got a really what we call pop and show, you know, like it's a really nice audience that could could go head to head with other bigger shows and around the world. So I'm just really proud of what this community has built. And it's just a really positive thing to see um, people come once a month. And it just also feels like a nightlife thing. Like, yeah, it's a place to be on a Friday night once a month. And that's an honor. So do you feel like, um, Doran, you're an educator, among many other things. Do you feel like you are in the process of education? Um, do you feel like you are is sort of um, your role as an educator is triggered or is engaged during this process? Like I come in to give my first show, right? Is it a, a very sort of autodidactic experience? So it's like, hey, come in, ask your friends, figure it out on your own. Um, figure out how to write your own poetry, like just listen, learn, ask questions, but you do you, is that how it goes? Or is, did Medium, for example, learn specific techniques to be able to write her poem within 40 minutes? Um, do you uh, understand the, the nature of the question? Yeah, I would say it's definitely, the show itself is not, a, it doesn't have an educational component to me. We are not coming to impart any poetry, they could see it a different way. So I would love to hear from Miriam and Solomon if they disagree. But uh, I just see it as more so uh, positive self-expression through the arts, you know, and I don't that doesn't feel like an educational experience. And when I say that in the sense that you are not knowledge is not being imparted on you in a way that comes off like there's a teacher speaking to a student right now. Miriam may craft a poem so well that a person feel like they were just schooled, like, ooh, you know. But for the most part, I would say it's more of a communal uh, experience of sharing positive energy with the crowd, feeding the artist to have confidence, the artists coming and imparting their, their stories, their journeys, their perspectives. And that does that rarely comes off in a poem that might be like, and hey, you need to get your life together. You need to, it doesn't come off in that way. Um, but you know, the art center has off the stage programming, um, and they always try to find ways to kind of tie us in to the larger community, whether it be rooftop or visiting poets that come from other artistic programming at the art center. But for example, we just launched Rooftop Junior and that was like probably one of my favorite things that has an educational component. So basically we had four to five of our poets uh, and basically we got into small groupings. Miriam, you were there as well. Uh, and Solemn, they were some of the co-facilitators of about 20 youth. And basically we uh, kind of prepared them for performance and writing. And then on the same day, they did an open mic. So there are elements and components usually off the stage where we're kind of taking on a more educational component. Some of us have spoken to various classes, have been involved in some of their projects, even including uh, data input and how that could be related to poetry. So there are things that we do outside of the show, but I would not say that the show itself is 
majority of educational experience. Cool. Okay. Um, I want to wrap up real quick, but before we do, um, I'd love to understand what people can expect um, next week at the Ramadan show. So, um, Maryam, maybe let's start with you. And then, because I believe, are you hosting this one? Are you emceeing this? Yes. Okay, yeah. cool. So let's hear it. So this li- this episode is going live next week before the show. So um, tell us what people can expect. Um, so basically it's called the Reflection Edition. And from my understanding, Dorian, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's basically um, an event where everyone can come and uh, perform um, and it's going to be around Ramadan theme or like spirituality reflection uh, along the lines of these themes. Yeah, right. What, what day, gonna be, time and where? Yeah. Sorry, it's gonna be, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I thought you wanted me to say the technical stuff. Go ahead, Mary. No, go ahead, Dorian. Uh, March 31st, we have a oud uh, set by Jad al uh who's a part of the open mic community uh, in the UAE. Um, he'll be doing an oud set from 9 to 9.30. So we're also like pushing the show back uh, out of respect for uh, all the family-oriented happenings uh, occurring during uh, Ramadan. Um, and the show performance will start at 9.30, and we intentionally took away uh, musicians, hip-hop. We took away the DJ and replaced it with a, a, a oudist. Uh, yeah. So... We're just trying to be very sensitive to the time of the year um, with this reflection edition. And I think uh, it's going to be really nice to kind of see how it all comes together. Cool. Salem, are you going to be there as well? Family stuff. <laughs> Salem's having a hard time with his, his mute button. Uh, there yeah. go. Uh, no, I will not. But that's because, you know, that those hours in Ramadan... Uh, there's no way to get away from family and you know listen rooftop like you said it's from september to may they're not going to miss me in april but i will miss them so mikey that's the kind of the interesting thing is to kind of see like we've done this for this many years let's go ahead and you know try to offer something compelling and also respectful to the time um and then you know a lot of it's trial and error so yeah all based on maybe we don't get the 200 plus people we're used to maybe 100 people come but they say it was a transformative experience maybe miriam says i love it but dorian i really wanted to be with my parents tonight and you know so the art center and uh, rooftop and the, uh, all the the people involved uh, we felt like it's time to kind of try to you know bring forth the show during ramadan uh, but we're also very sensitive to all the various dynamics uh, of this being kind of a family time for people so, Absolutely. So it is March 31st, which is a Friday. Uh-huh. All our shows are Friday. Friday evening in Abu Dhabi. Uh, where's the location? Okay, so it's also the cool thing we're excited about. It's at the amazing the Black Box at the Art Center at NYU Abu Dhabi. And this is a state of art, one of their state-of-the-art venues. We're mostly in a place called the Marketplace, which is a really nice cafe-style area with kind of like stucco-type vibe uh you know torn away brick uh different food outlets but the black box is going to be interesting because it's a you know fully focused on the theater element itself and yeah. i'm sure you can imagine the black box um so we're really excited about trying it at this venue which is um directly at the art center okay, which is amazing. Abu Dhabi's campus. all right well it i i'm super excited to hear how it goes um it is a pleasure. It's been a pleasure to speak to all three of you. I've been a fan of uh, Rooftop to Rhythms. There. Uh, that's the surprise of this show. We oh, all yeah. together to fly you there on the 30th. Okay, <laughs> deal. I'll be uh, I'll be going up as a first timer. All right. That'll all right, everybody. Salam, Mariam, Dorian, thank you so much for joining us. If anyone's listening, wants to find out more, just type Rooftop Rhythms, NYU, Abu Dhabi, you'll find a ton of information. Uh, You can also find all the information on the Art Center uh, Instagram page as well. Dorian, thank you so much. Thank you, Mikey. And I also wanted to thank Solomon and Miriam for taking time out right before Ramadan. 
thank you too for all you've done for the poetry community. Um, just as Emirati is welcoming us, welcoming us into the UAE, but also just being fierce supporters of culture, arts, and our poetry show. So thank you so much. I didn't plan that either, so don't cross up. Follow Rooftop Rhythms on Instagram, rooftop underscore rhythms. There you go. You heard thank it here. You so thank you for having us, Mikey, and it was lovely talking to you. Thank Dorian. you so much. Thank you all. Take care, everyone.